Hello everyone and welcome to my podcast. This is Ann P of Fiber, Floss and Fiction. Today is Monday, it is February 8th, 2021. If you're a new viewer, welcome. I hope that you find a reason to come back and join me again in the future. Uh, and if you're a returning viewer, thank you as always for choosing to spend some time with me today. I've got my normal kind of three things to talk about, some knitting, some books, and some cross stitch. Um, not much life update to report. It's all quiet here. Um, gonna be a busy rest of the month, so I wanted to pop in and make sure I got this done uh, before things kind of got away from me. So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll jump right in and get started. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is knitting. I have a few finished pieces to show, share with you all this time. Uh, the first is a finished color work hat. This is the cranberry holiday hat. I didn't really do it in very holiday-ish or cranberry-ish colors, although the original is beautiful. It has like a dark charcoal and cranberry red and some pink in it, but I did use up some leftovers of DK weight yarns that I had. You might remember the really, really dark purple, this Adobe, and then the kind of hand paint. I used in the No Harm No Cowl I showed you last time. The blue is a, um, let me back up. Those three yarns I pointed out are all Miss Babs Yowza. Uh, it's a DK weight yarn that she sells either single skeins or in coordinated color three packs that are like half skeins. And then the blue is a hand dyed wool silk blend from a Spirit Trail Fiberworks. I've had leftovers in my stash forever and ever. I thought that this pattern would finish using them up, but it did not. I still have more left, so you'll see it again, but it's a great denim type color. Just very subtle variegations. So uh, I did use up most of two of the three colors that uh, were the Miss Babs colorways. So I'm, I'm in the home stretch on kind of getting all of that out of stash, but love this pattern. It's a great way to use up some DK weight stash. And I probably will knit it again. I might even knit it in the, I mean, I like this color palette, but I might even knit it in the kind of more traditional like cranberry colors that she calls for. So, so that is finished. And then I zoomed through my adventurous stole slash scarf slash shawl. The pattern is by Amba O'Brien, and I used two sets of minis. I, these are not curated minis. I just picked minis I had in my stash and worked with what I had. So the first half of the triangle is mostly warm colors. So the yellows and pinks, I think you guys saw this in progress last time. And then the second half of the shawl is blues and greens and some darker grays. Um, it is shaped as kind of a parallelogram. So there's a rectangle here in the center because it's two triangles sewn together and then it comes out with pointed ends. It's very hard to show because it's really long. Um, it, was a, it was a fun and super quick knit. It, all it is is garter stitch and increases so there's no charts there's no nothing she just tells you when to alternate the, the minis throughout and i mostly used speckled dyed yarns although not all of them are um oops I'm showing it with the outside outside out i don't love the shape of it it's a little bit hard to wear because let me see if i can kind of show it comes to these points right here which is sort of the tip of each triangle or the tip of this triangle and then there's a matching one you know down here but it makes kind of an odd little bump it doesn't hang totally straight like a stole it's fine if you kind of scrunch it up around your neck like that and 
just let the colors carry the show. Um, but I don't think it's a super easy shape to wear, even though it is easy to knit and a great way to use up minis. Um, I still have pretty much all of the colors left. I think there was only one because I used it twice in the um, fade part of that. So I still have little bits and pieces of minis. So I'm not sure if I'll add those into my um, cozy memories blanket or if I have enough to do that or if I'll use them for something else. But I really loved playing with the colors in that. And like I said, it was a very quick and easy knit. So all good. Uh, let's go on. We'll talk about the two pieces that I have kind of in progress. The first of these is my broadleaf shawl. And that is... Or, shawl sweater it's a two color brioche sweater that i'm knitting um, using one strand of the turquoise blue for the kind of contrast of the leaf shapes and then i'm using a fingering weight yarn held with a mohair lace weight yarn for the background if i do that i think you can kind of see the patterning a little bit more easily so the front is finished it's just a big old square finished and blocked and then I'm working on the back and I'm about not quite three quarters of the way up the back but close and here is what the back is gonna look like so that's the strand of uh, mohair and the strand of sock weight yarn that are being held together for that. So it creates a really nice kind of airy fabric. That's the back, reverse side, that's the front. It has kind of a painterly quality to it. It's sort of like an impressionistic painting, I think, the way the colors kind of blend throughout. Um, and again, no shaping on that. They're just two big squares that you seam up the sides and seam the shoulders and then add the two sleeves in that you knit from here down to the cuff. So hoping to get that finished up in the next week and then I can get the body seam together and kind of figure out how I'm going to deal with the sleeves themselves. Um, but really enjoying that and working on that for kind of a big project over the next month or two. And then I am currently working on sock two of the pair of my bow ties are cool socks. The designer for those, oh, and I should say the designer for the broadleaf sweater is wool and pine. Wool and pine. The two types of yarn I'm using, um, I'm using a skein of Wooly Wonka Fibers Ayrton sock for the turquoise blue. And then I'm holding two Hedgehog Fibers yarns together. One is their regular sock in the colorway method and the merino, or sorry, silk and mohair lace is also Hedgehog Fibers. It's a different color called Salty Tails. So that's what I'm using for that one. Um, bow ties are cool. The designer is Amanda Harrington. Here is what they will look like when they're done. They just have a little textured pattern on them. Very subtle. And I had finished up sock number one. I think the last time I talked to you guys, is that true? Yeah. So here's sock number one. So that's completely finished. And I am working currently on sock number two. I have the leg knit and I have the heel knit and I have turned the heel. So I'm working my way down onto the foot and knitting the, the gusset here. So a little further than halfway on these on this on this one and hoping to get those done this week so I have a actual pair to wear the yarn is from yarn yarn co 
It's their um, MCN Twist Base, which is the Superwash Merino Cashmere Nylon that has a fairly tight twist to it. And the colorway is Labradorite. So there's their card. I don't think that they're active anymore. At least I haven't been able to find like social media accounts or anything like that. Um, but they do have a lot of nice speckled dyes and have several of their yarns in stash or that I've recently used as part of my kind of ongoing stash down quest. So those will be on the needles to work on over the next few days. And like I said, I'd like to try to get those finished up this week. I think that's it. Um, I have a couple other projects that I'm thinking about casting on, just some smaller things and uh, not, nothing specific planned yet other than the to work on my broadleaf sweater and the socks that I just showed you. So I think that's it on knitting. Did pretty good, kept it, kept it under 15 minutes. Let's move on. We'll talk about some books and reading. So I have more books to talk to you guys about this week. I have definitely been on a reading kick. So I've got one, two, three, four finished books to tell you all about. Um, the first one is an audible book that I read called The Guinevere Deception. The author is Kirsten White. This is a retelling of the Guinevere and Arthur tale. It is a young adult novel. Um, so it follows the arrival of Guinevere at Arthur's court in Camelot, and she's introduced to his knights and Mordred. And we come to find that she has a great many oddities about her. She is not your usual girl. And she has been sent by Merlin to help protect Arthur from the dark forces of fairy and the dark queen. So it's a retelling that pulls in kind of more magic. Um, Camelot has outlawed the use of magic, but uh, our heroine, Guinevere, uh, still knows types of magic that she's using to try to protect Arthur from the dark magic. So this is the first in a trilogy, and I was okay with this book kind of ending where it did. It wasn't a complete cliffhanger, but from what I've read of the reviews, book two kind of doesn't really advance the Guinevere Arthur story particularly. Um, it kind of just goes off on a tangent. And then book three does kind of begin to close the loop on some of the ends that are left hanging at the end of book one. So I haven't decided yet if I'm going to pick up books two and three. Um, I enjoyed this book. It, it, it was good, not great, but good. I liked the twists that the author included, um, some things that you know about the traditional Guinevere and Arthur tale are kind of turned on their heads, and it has explanations for some of the things that we know from the classic story. Uh, with this retelling, it kind of explains the behind the scenes of um, like how Lan Lancelot comes to Camelot and becomes the Queen's champion and why, Mord why Mordred is a difficult character. Um, I really actually liked him quite a bit. Um, he was a more rounded character for me than Arthur was. Um, and I think of, of the reviews I read, there's a lot of folks who, who felt that way too. So um, entertaining and a fun read. Uh, like I said, good, but not great. And it does definitely fall firmly within the young adult genre. Um, it's not, there's nothing too graphic in it that you couldn't let your teenage child person read. Okay, the next book I read is called The Mermaid and the Strongman, and the author is Kathleen Shoup. So I had gotten this as a freebie off of um, Amazon at some point. And I, I guess didn't realize until I started it that it's book two in a three book series, but it's okay because it stands alone on its own. It's a little bit um, truncated at the end. The story kind of just ends, 
but it ends with some conclusions so that you don't feel like you're completely left hanging. It's a historic fiction and it's set in the town of D Donora, which is basically the stand-in for Pittsburgh. And it's set in Western Pennsylvania uh, in the early 19 teens. It's a small town on the Monongahela River where pretty much the entire town is filled with folks who work for the steel mill industry in one way or another. And the town has a great many immigrants in it, mostly Poles, some Czechs, uh, some Irish. And because there's been successive waves of immigrants that have come into work, some of the immigrants have gotten married and so we now have the next generation sort of first generation Americans but Americans who are very tied to kind of old world customs about marriage and um, family life and celebrating the holidays and things like that. So the two main characters are this young woman who um, her family are, are Czechoslovakian and they are always scrounging for money. She's the eldest daughter. Her father works in the coal mines that supply the steel industry. Her mother is the, the home keeper, but they also take in boarders to help supplement their income. And um, Mary, the daughter, it, it, she's only 14, but she's already gone to work. She cleans house and takes care of the kids for the mill owner's wife in in the town. And um, she kind of is longing for something more, but she's not really sure what that is yet. The second character, and she represents the mermaid. She loves to swim. The second character is um, Lucas, who is a, an immigrant. The story for him actually begins when he's still in Poland and wins this ticket that pays for his um, steerage fare to come to America. And so he's the local, uh, he's, he's a younger man, he's unmarried. He, in his town in Poland, he's kind of the local strongman. He wins bets and picks up some extra pocket money by um, out physically performing other people. Like they have a hay bale throwing contest and he wins it and a handstand contest and he wins that. So he comes to America with um, this ticket in his pocket. He's, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he's not somebody who is well-educated. He doesn't speak English, but by force of his strength, he winds up getting a job working in the steel mills. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. I wanted to get some water so y'all didn't have to listen to me cough for the rest of my podcast. Um, okay, so the mermaid and the strongman. So Lucas comes to the United States and he gets a job in the mill. He and Mary don't really have the same circles except that the, um, the town is small enough that kind of everybody knows everybody. And uh, so the book tells the story of him getting accustomed to American life, figuring out his path, um, trying to save money to save up for the American dream, if you will. And then also parallels Mary kind of coming to terms with, you know, the customs of her family. Some are wonderful and some are not wonderful. And how does she pick which of those is right for her as kind of the new American girl? Um, I think I like this book mostly because I know the area that it's set in in the United States and so that was fun that tie-in was fun for me but also that the uh, descriptions of kind of the different customs that are followed throughout the year were really fun and I appreciated that the author was able to create these two characters who you want to know more about and whose life you lives you become invested in so uh, a good read. Uh, I recommended it to Julia, who also likes that area of the country. She likes stories about that. So 
Um, if any of those things sound like a book you would like, I would, I would recommend it. Okay, uh, the next book is a print book that my folks sent me called Mort Main Hall. The author is Martin Edwards. This is also the second in a series. I have not read the first one, but you can read this as a, as a standalone. It's a British mystery set in the 1930s. Uh, the main character in book one has um, kind of been an inquiry agent. She's helped the, the police solve a mystery in book one. She is the daughter of a judge um, who had a very constricted childhood. She basically grew up in this family mansion that's on an island off the coast and pretty much raised herself. Her mother was absent and the judge was on the mainland working until he begins to lose his mind and then he comes home to this mansion, to this uh, house that she's living in with three servants and he slowly loses his mind and winds up passing away. We find all that out from book one, but reiterated in book two. So she and the help of this young newspaperman who is fascinated with her, um, her personality, her enigmaticness, igni if that's a word, um, that she is trying to figure out Three, how three um, court cases are involved because on the surface they don't seem to be, what the common thread in all of them is, and then to figure out how that's been tied into this mystery death. The book opens with her attempting to save this man who has been living under a false identity. He's come back to London to attend his mother's funeral after he's concocted this story where he has appeared to have already died, but he's assumed a new identity, he's moved to Tangier, and, and is living under an, an assumed name. He comes back to the UK for his mother's funeral, and she's convinced he's going to be killed. And it turns out she's right. So there's all of these um, subplots and things that are historically based about the rise of fascism and kind of um, the home front spying by both people who were pro-Hitler and people who were trying to protect the UK government um, kind of all mixed in together as well as these people who were tried for various crimes, these three seemingly unrelated crimes where the accused uh, got off at the trial. So she's busy tying all of these little knots up together. It is very Agatha Christie-ish, and she's sort of a crusty, she's young, but crusty, <laughs> uh, female Poirot. So very fun. I would definitely read more of these. The only criticism that I would have with this is it's obvious the author loves cricket. I don't know very much about cricket, um, the game, not the insect. And there are a lot of passages in this book devoted to the description of a cricket game, which I skimmed because I don't need three pages about cricket. I'm just, I know enough about it to know what it is. I don't need to know the details. There were cricket details in this book. So, hey, if you love cricket and English murder mysteries, this is an excellent one. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, the book, the last book is called Midnight Labyrinth. I also listened to this on Audible. The author is Elizabeth Hunter, and she has, I believe it's three separate book series that are all set in kind of the same world reality. This is the first in her Elemental Mysteries series, of which there are like four and a half. There's four and then a small book of novellas about the same universe. The main characters in this series are uh, Ben Vecchio, who is human, and his partner Tenson, who is a 5,000 year old vampire. And they are, I won't call them treasure hunters, but they investigate and look for 
antiquities that have some monetary value. So this is the kind of second group of books in the same world vision. The first are the um, are also about elemental vampires, meaning the vampire classes are the water, the air, the earth, and then fire vampires. And the first set of four of these books follows Giovanna, Giovanni Vecchio, who is a fire vampire, but he researches old books and manuscripts. And uh, I have read these a long time ago. I just picked up the set to reread because I forgot how much I enjoyed them. But the first four are about him, uh, Giovanni Vecchio, and this young researcher who he meets while he's looking for this old manuscript, Beatrice. So that story arc has kind of been told. This is the next story arc that deals with Ben Vecchio, who is Giovanni's adopted son. He is human. Um, he is the product of a really rough childhood, but he now has this ancient vampire partner and they uh, investigate expensive and very rare antiquities. And the Midnight Labyrinth centers on this series of three oil paintings that go, um, two of which are on exhibit that were painted during World War II or just before the war. And the third one of the triptych has vanished. And so they set out to try to find the painting and they're going to try to find out where it is and then get it returned to its lawful owners because it had been stolen during the war. So it kind of builds on those two characters who we've been introduced to in the previous set of four books, um, but it, it expands and moves on more with their story. Um, I didn't think I was going to like this book at all when I started reading or listening to it because the narrator, when he read the title and said his name, it was like there was no, his voice was completely monotone and there was no expression in it whatsoever. Um, but I guess that's just how he says his name and read the title because I really enjoyed his reading of the book so much so that when I finished it, I picked up the next book in this series that still follows Ben and Tenzin called Blood Apprentice. So that's what I'm reading, listening to right now. So I guess they're calling it a paranormal mystery because it's got a vampire in it who is an act, several vampires who are active um, members of the, the cast of characters, but it's really about art theft and the recovery of this painting. That's kind of the main storyline within it. And Yes, there are things that this vampire does that humans could not do, but the overall storyline is this art theft mystery. So a little combination of those two genres. They're fun. They're light reading. I enjoy this author's writing style. So like I said, um, I'm listening to book two of that set of four. Um, it's relatively new. I don't think the fourth book is out yet. Um, but that's, I mean, that's fine. I'm not in any rush to get through them. I'm just enjoying those for right now. So that's it for books. Let's go on. We're going to talk cross stitch next. Okay, so in cross stitch, um, let's start first with the piece that I um, was working on at the end of January. And that is The Winter's Encounter by Laura Prindle, artwork by Laura Prindle and charted by Heaven and Earth Designs. It's the mini I'm doing, and you'll see it's not super, super big. But that's the artwork. I'm stitching this as per my usual on, on a 25 count um, Easy Guide pre-gridded fabric, and I'm doing one over one crosses. So here's where I am now. The edge of this design is like right there. It's just underneath the Q-snap edge. You can see it ends right there. 
Um, and so I have finished one, two, three full pages. There's a partial page down here that I believe is like 37 rows deep. So it comes to about there. And I'm currently working on this page right here. I'm actually pretty impressed that the very, very pale gray is showing up this well. It, it sometimes gets a little washed out, but at any rate, um, bring that in a little closer so you can see what I have left. Uh, just a little bit left in his muzzle, but mostly background left here. These are the reins that are attached to a larger branch that's kind of down here in this little half piece. And then I had worked pretty consistently on this front portion of his, his forelegs. So I think next time that I get this out, um, which will be this month, I'm going to be working on this for Kelly of Animal Instincts uh, 40th birthday Sal, because um, her prompt was to either do a new start, which I'm not really doing this year, not officially anyway, um, or to work on something with an animal in it, which I think this certainly qualifies for. Um, so this will be out later this month. So I'm going to finish working on this page. I think when I get that done, that my next task is I'm going to come across and like finish these two little short ones so that I'm completely finished this everything from here over to the far edge. And if you look on the mock-up, hopefully you can see that, that basically gets me to about there. So I have a set of pages that are most of the saddle and then a full set of pages that are most of his hind quarters. And then there's a partial that finishes up his tail and the trees up on the hillside there. I'm really excited to get to the saddle because it's kind of hard to see from that small picture, but the saddle has, the leather has hand tooling on it. So I think that that will be really fun to stitch with all of that detail. So like I said, next time the page cuts off kind of right about there. It's just under the winged bird. So once I finish this current page that I'm on with the reins hanging down, I'll come over, I'll finish the bottom of this, this little bush right here. And then this kind of plain open gray space on him, but I'm really pleased with how much detail there is on this mini. I mean, I think it's going to look fantastic on the wall. Um, let's see kind of just the reflection in it, in his eye. And, you know, even though his muzzle's gray, which is not actually gray, it's mostly purples in real life, but it reads as gray. Um, you can still kind of see the shape of his mouth and his nostril there. And I love that windswept mane as it blows past him in the breeze. So this was a nice seasonal one since it's still very cold here in New Mexico in Jan well, February now. Um, but yeah, so I really enjoyed working on that. This will be out again, uh, like I said, in February. And then my other piece that I brought to show you that I worked on is my Once Upon a Fairy Tale. So that is where this one is now. I've been working up here mostly, um, added a little bit, a few stitches over here, but mostly I'm concentrating on this. This right here is a page break, so I'm trying to bring this up here and finish this and then I'm going to go over and finish filling these in so that I've got that whole shape finished and then I'll come back and work further this way. So this section has the prints and I started this banner. There's another banner that hangs over the female figure on this side and then this is there's a big arch right here in the center and there's greenery that kind of comes down around here so that's what I'm working on in that section. And this page actually uh, is not too bad. This is the supersized max color version. So there is a fair amount of 
switching up of threads, as you might guess, you know, colors. But uh, there's actually sections that have fair amounts of just here's one color that I'm stitching in. So very much enjoying that one. I think it looks amazing. And it's fun to have started the castle wall with the extra greenery bits on it. Um, so I put, I think about 1600 stitches in that so far this month. And I will be, I will have it out again for about another 800 stitches at some point. Um, I'm using that for the Full Coverage Fanatics book challenge for this month. We're doing three books that fall under the romance genre. Uh, I've got Out, Outlander, Like Water for Chocolate, and I can't remember what the third one is. Hang on. I have it written down, I think. Oh, no, I don't have it in this book. Okay. But another another romance book. I will not probably get the 8,300 stitches that Outlander's page count matches up to finished, but I think between Winter's A Counter and Once Upon a Fairy Tale, I'll get the other two books done. So that's my plan to work on those as the month rolls on. Now, the one thing I did not bring with me to show to you all because I have it on my frame just set it up yesterday, want to just leave it on there and work on it, is the Joan Elliott Celtic Wheel. So it's out for probably five days where I'm going to focus on it here at the beginning of the month and see how far I get on it. So I'll show it to you next time I podcast. And it'll be out for a total of 10 days this month. So I'm, fingers crossed, going to get some time to really focus on it and get some good progress on it. So I'll be about two thirds done the final half, if that makes sense. So I had half left to go, which I'd like to try to finish by the end of March. So if I can get two thirds of it done to the, to the two thirds mark here in February, I feel like I can get it done in March. So I will be trying to give that some good focused attention this month. and. Uh, like I said, 10 days is what I've got budgeted for the time on it. Um, these first, well, the first six or so days of this month have not been great stitching ones. It's just been crazy, crazy busy here. Um, I'm hoping that that will calm down a little uh, now that I'm done all my teaching engagements and stuff and just back to normal work schedule. So coming up in March, um, I just this morning posted in the Full Coverage Fanatics group the uh, PDF that has all of the information for our March History Month challenge. And the basic premise of this challenge is I've, um, we've pulled together a list of events and their dates that have happened over the centuries. And those are listed and you can pick one or you can pick many of them depending on how much time you have to stitch. So you'll be choosing the year that the event happened and then you will can either pick a project that core that you can choose any theme that you want but you'll be stitching the number of stitches listed in the year. So if something happened in 1492 you'll stitch 1492 stitches on any choice of project. The second option is to not do any counting, but then you have to pick a project that fits that theme. So for instance, if it's something to do with, um, we've got Magellan um, sailing into and finding, if you will, not that it was lost, Guam. So if you wanted to um, select that, theme, you would look for things with explorers, world travel, that kind of thing. Um, we've got 1301, which uh, March 11th, 1301 or 02, that is supposedly the date that Romeo and Juliet got married. So for that one, the theme is romance, couples, love. So your choice, you can pick and choose whether you want to do counting or whether you want to do themed or you can be kind of like Kim and me and do both and just see how many different uh, dates or different prompts 
you can work on to make some progress on your full coverage pieces. As always, I'll put a link down below. Uh, if you'd like to come join our group, we would love to have you. It's another fun event. This one will run all of March. Um, unlike our February event, which is just one of the weekend events, it's the Big Strides weekend. It'll be the third weekend this month, which I think is the 19th through 21st, something like that. I do have that written down here. Um, yep, 19th through 21st. And so that's going to be um, a weekend, three-day weekend, to work on your largest full coverage project. Pretty straightforward. So um, Fairy Tale, my supersized max color, will be out for that. And that's probably when I'll focus on getting those last 800 stitches or so put into that if I can. All right, I think that is it for this go round. I'm gonna try to be back before the end of the month. That's my plan anyway. So let's see if I can do that. I hope that wherever you are in the world, you're staying well, staying safe, and hopefully have some time to enjoy some crafting and things that bring you joy at your end. So I will talk to you next time. And until then, everybody, be well. Bye for now.